Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, I am grateful to have you as a listener. It is Shay here and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. Today we will be visiting with Robbie Johnson of Gallagher about how we can build effective fences for grazing corn stalks. So Robbie's going to talk about the different materials, some design things, grounding, um, energizers, really you name it, Robbie's going to cover it. And this is actually a rerun from an episode last fall, but it was really just so valuable. I wanted to make sure that you hear it again, or maybe if you missed it, you for sure get to hear it. Before we dive into that, I want to remind you that registration is open for the quarter four rancher mind. So if you want to improve your business management skills on your operation, head to my website and hit the rancher mind tab. There'll be more information there with that. Let's visit with Robbie. All right, Robbie, thank you for joining me today to come on the show and talk about kind of some challenges farmers and ranchers face when it comes to fencing during the late fall and winter months, especially for those who are in the northern part of the United States. So to start off, can you talk about, you know, where you're located and give the audience a little bit of background on yourself and your involvement in the beef industry today? Yeah, so uh, Robbie Johnson. Uh, I'm from central Nebraska, uh, Custer County, right in the middle of Nebraska. So uh, we see, you know, similar weather from South Dakota, some of Kansas. Um, it can vary quite a bit. Um, you know, the things that, you know, the wintertime fencing or winter fencing issues, uh, I think one of the, um, the things that I've learned from my history um, you know, I've been with Gallagher for five and a half years, but I was also in the seed and forward side of things um, for many years before that. So, you know, at the time we would work on a lot of, um, you know, stockpile grazing or how to um, help producers with uh, making sure they have enough forage. So it kind of all goes hand in hand and what you're grazing and when. And so it's kind of been a fun adventure, um, you know, but when it comes to fencing in general, um, especially wintertime fencing, things happen quick. Um, you know, down here in Nebraska, the Dakotas, uh, a lot of the Midwest, a lot of cattle start getting put onto corn stalks. Uh, and usually a lot of corners start getting cut um, because they want to hurry up, put up fence and move cows in. Um, you know, so that's probably the biggest thing. You know, we'll visit, you know, more about the things that do get missed um but the biggest thing when you're when you're even temporary fencing or you, you know i don't want to say temporary because a lot of the corn stock is four to six months so it's almost a half a year sometimes um but just take time um the products you purchase um buy the best you can afford uh, because quality products do alleviate a lot of issues um, it may not be this year, but it's the next two, three, four, five, six years down the road. Um, but probably the first thing, you know, I talk about uh, in the wintertime with uh, winter fencing is majority of solar units. Um, take your solar units out now uh, or two weeks before you're ready. Clean the panels up. Make sure the batteries are charged. Uh, make sure everything's working and don't just take that energizer that's been in the Quonset all year and go stick it on the fence post and turn it on because um, that's probably the biggest issue with solar units. They just don't get run all the time and batteries are going to be the biggest problem. Um, as you get further north, um, you know, where you start getting into, um, you know, shorter daylight and stuff like that, bigger panels will be needed uh, just to accumulate more sunlight as fast as you can. Um, so batteries and solar panel sizes uh, will change a little bit, uh, but like we've got a really good selection of, of units that are all in one. It's a solar panel, the batteries, the energizer, you pick it up and go. Um, so those units will be um, sized accordingly. Uh, but if people are making a battery unit and buying solar units uh, with an energizer, kind of building your own, just make sure you those are put together with appropriate sizes. Um, you know, the couple of the things uh, when it comes to temporary fencing, 
uh, with solar units, uh, energizers in general, and corn stalks, let's say. Um, you know, a lot of times people want to stick that energizer on top of a T post, and then they just take the ground rod clamp and clamp it to the T post. Um, you know, and two to three feet at the most um, on a good year with a rusty T post isn't quite adequate, you know, not preferred or adequate. Um, so, but, you know, invest in a six foot ground rod or two six foot ground rods, you know, and try to use an actual ground rod clamp um, and don't try to twist it around it um, just because you can't get that real tight connection. So, um, you know, that's another really big issue that I see um, is grounding is still a, a non uh, used or sought after as much when that is a big portion of it. Um, this year in Nebraska, um, you know, it's extremely dry. Um, so grounding is going to be a really big factor. Um, but you can also do a hot ground system. You know, we've got some different diagrams on our website. There's a lot of them out there of how to do a hot ground system with two wires. So, you know, that is an option for producers that are, you know, in a, a really dry area like we are. Um, you know, and there's areas even from clear up to, well, Oak, Texas, clear north that are extremely dry. Um, fortunately, you know, the Dakotas have seen really good rains in certain areas, but there's also areas that are needing some moisture too. So um, just kind of keep that in mind when it comes to grounding. Well, those are some great tips. And I appreciate you talking about the energizer standpoint. And with these shorter days coming on, you mentioned you may need the larger panels if you're doing the solar powered option and the grounding part. That's something that's been talked about a lot on other episodes of this show. When we talk about fencing is you need to have a proper grounding system. So I appreciate you bringing those to light again. So what are some of those other corners that kind of get cut when people are putting up fences for corn stalks, because that is kind of the season we're in. Yep. So, you know, the, you know, we consider the three viable things. They're going to be your in energizer, of course, your grounding, and also your components. Um, you know, just like anything, your components, if, you know, a lot of the wintertime fencing is used on the traditional rebar post, uh, which everybody's seen, uh, you know, just with the standard screw on rod post insulator with the rebar post. Um, a lot of them, millions, thousands of them are out there. Uh, but one of the biggest things that I see with those is, you know, trying to utilize um, cheaper insulators that have maybe extended their life. Um, you know, if they've been beat up and thrown in a trailer and hauled around, uh, check your insulators out really well. Uh, make sure they're tight because uh, you can lose current through old cracked insulators. A um, couple options for those. Um, you know, as you get into winter months, a lot of animals start to bunch up. You know, if it's antelope or mule deer, elk, whatever the case might be. Um, some of the things to look for in high traffic areas, say deer crossings, uh, where animals are crossing a lot and you're starting to see a lot of those rod post insulators getting knocked off and your fence is dead. Um, look at, you know, we've got some options like a ring top post. Um, they're a glass nylon head to them. So you really can't, the insulator can't come off of them. The, the top of it is built on. Uh, there's no wire inside this loop. So you're not going to rub through it like a standard pigtail post and ground out. So you don't necessarily have to build a whole fence with it, but try them in your problem areas um, to keep those deer, you know, and typically if we get snow, let's hope we do this year. Uh, but those trails become pretty predominant, you know, and take five or six posts and just replace them because those will stand up a lot better to, you know, the wintertime migration or, um, you know, as herds really start building up and coming into fields or whatever the case is. So, you know, your posts um, are really valuable. Um, and as we, if we ever get moisture, that's hopefully we do, hopefully I can jinx it enough to where, you know, the, the central part of the state starts making up some rain. And, uh, but if you get into harder grounds, um, you know, and say it starts getting into, you know, 
late October, November, you know, if we get some moisture and starts freezing, uh, even December, um, there's different options you can look at with bigger feet. Like we've got a heavy duty um, ring top insulator. It's got a really big foot to it. Um, so you can step them in the ground a lot easier. Um, you know, sometimes with the rod post insulators, you see the, the post upside down and the T post sitting on the spade. Um, sometimes it's because the top gets bent and stuff like that. So um, there again, just take time beforehand, you know, take a day, go through your uh, insulators on the post, make sure they're good. Um, and a couple of things for safety sake in the wintertime, there's a lot of um, wire gates. A lot of people just buy a handle, make a wire gate, put it across, and those are really hard to see, um, especially if, you know, people don't know it's there, you're building the gate, but there's options like the spring gates. Um, you know, we've got a bungee gate, the spring gates are really visible. Um, they're very effective in being seen, um, super conductive. So look at your gate options, um, you know, make sure that they're, the connections are all really well. Um, and just try to make everything as if it was a permanent fence. Uh, it's just that there's a lot of products out there now that can be taken down or added really quickly to make your life easier. Well, thank you for sharing that. So when we look at permanent, permanent fence structures that, um, you know, maybe there's a cross fence or like an offset built on around the perimeter, are the mistakes you see people there similar or the same to what are made with the temporary fence? Or are there different mistakes that um, people with offsets need to be aware of? You know, the, a lot of the producers that are building um, permanent fencing, you know, a three, four, five wire high tensile fence, um, you will see their temporary fencing built a little better. Um, just because they know they've run into the issues um, a lot more than, you know, the guys that are typically behind barbed wire. Uh, but a couple things, you know, even to think about too, when permanent fencing for wintertime um, or temporary fencing, you know, this year it's been extremely dry. The past few days have been extremely windy. And I've noticed a lot of tumbleweeds um, blowing up on fences. Um that can be an issue when it comes to snow. If we get a lot of snow, that's just a really big um, break and you start getting drifting on that. So, you know, if you start seeing big buildups of tumbleweeds, uh, you know, if you've got areas, you know, if your fence is running east and west with predominant north winds in the wintertime, you know, just check those fence lines out. You know, if you've got some really tall weeds that have grown up, um, just try to mow them over get rid of them so that all that snow drift isn't starting to catch on your fence. Cause there's times that in, especially you up in North Dakota and South Dakota, you've seen drifts where they just walk right over the top of them, you know, there and, is that. <laughs> so there's some things we can't, uh, can't always fix. Uh, but if we can try to think about it, um, that's just going to be one of those things that will make your life easier. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, Typically, you know, your permanent fencing with electric fencing or your offsets, um, if it's a, the first year you've had it, you'll see where problems are. But, you know, for the most part, your permanent fencing or perimeter fencing isn't going to be an issue for you. Well, awesome. So what I'm really hearing is that prevention is key when it comes to making sure you have a successful and effective fence when it comes to winter grazing. So if you could, you know, summarize what we've talked about in three steps, what would those three steps be to make sure that producers get started on the right foot as they're putting up fence for grazing corn stalks? So, yeah, putting up fence, you know, make sure you have the components you need um, and check your older components. Uh, make sure you're not using something that isn't made to do something else. Um, a lot of times that does happen. You know, oh, I've got this, I'll make it work. Well, um, you know, one error can definitely make a big difference in fence. Um, so check your components. If it's used stuff, make sure it's in good shape. Um, two, if it's a new product, make sure you know how it works. Uh, if it's an energizer, solar energizers, 
make sure they're charged up, you know, I'll say two weeks before you need them. Uh, just because sometimes those old batteries, if you haven't been using them all year, could take up to a week to break that charge cycle. Um, and three, just make sure you can actually test it, you know, and that could be a, a simple as like a DVM. Uh, we've got fault finders, uh, which can actually test the fence. Uh, you can test grounding with it. There's different ways you can do that. Um, you know, a tester is just one of those parts that if you got electric fence, you need to have a good tester to see what the fence is actually doing and capable of. Well, thank you very much for all your insight. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share with the listeners before we wrap up today? Keep your fingers crossed for a lot of wet snow this year in, in good amounts. We don't need three or four feet, but uh, just remember we've got territory managers in every state. Um, you know, we're available online. If you ever have any questions, just reach out to your local dealer or contact us and we'll be more than happy to help you out. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. And for those who are listening to the audio, Robbie showed some great examples of some of the actual technology. So if you want a visual, head over to Facebook or YouTube to watch that or use the link in the show notes to go to the Gallagher website where you can uh, look at all those materials for yourself. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.